Statistics. Confidence interval when standard deviation of population is not known. Get ready and some coffee, because if we want to get futuristic, we need statistics. You're not required to, but if you have access to this OneNote file, we're first a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever, because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Currently in the OneNote presentation section, 1960 confidence interval when standard deviation of population is not known tab. Looking at a situation similar to recent presentations, except this one, the standard deviation not being known is going to lead us to not use the normal distributions, but rather T distributions, which we will get back to shortly. But first, there are similarities in that we're looking at a large population. We want to find information about that population, but we can't test every item within the population. It's too big. Therefore, our strategy, as always, taking a sample, hoping that we can test the sample and apply the findings found from the sample to the characteristics of the larger population, two techniques typically used to do that, one being hypothesis testing, two being the confidence intervals. Hypothesis testing lending itself to situations where we think we know what that middle point is, such as, for example, if the bag of peanuts says there's on average so many 2,500 peanuts in the bag, for example, we can build our bell curve around that hypothesis, then run a tests, run samples to see if the sample results are far enough away for us to reject the original hypothesis. Confidence intervals, on the other hand, typically lend themselves to situations where we just don't know what that middle point is. That's what we're trying to find. Therefore, the results we get from the sample are typically going to be our middle point which we will create an interval around. You could still use like a hypothesis testing method by basically saying, hey, look, if this is what we found, this middle point, we could hypothesize what if it was an average over here? Would our findings be far enough away if this was the actual middle point for us to reject this hypothesis? And we could repeat that process hypothesizing each of these points, in which case we would have like peak to peak, which would define our interval. But it would be easier for us to build a curve around uh, the center point. So typically we're gonna have our sample, we're gonna build the curve around the sample, which uh, if we have, for example, the standard deviation of the population, we might more likely use the normal bell-shaped curve to create our interval. However, if we don't know the standard deviation of the population, it's gonna be more difficult for us to estimate that spread. And we might then use T distributions, especially when our sample size uh, is relatively small. And typically if our sample size is small, we also have to be careful that we're able to use, are we able to use the, the central limit theorem to tend towards a bell-shaped curve? and uh, in this case, possibly not if we have a small sample size, therefore might work best in cases where the actual data uh, tends towards a bell-shaped situation, such as, for example, if we're looking at errors or that peanut example, how many peanuts are in a bag of peanut, you would expect that the distribution would be somewhat bell-shaped around uh, a, a central point. Now, the T distributions then are gonna be the same kind of concept, although using different formulas than the normal distribution. And the general idea is that the graph will be a little bit thicker in the tails. So we'll look much similar, thicker in the tails. What does it mean to be thicker in the tails of the graph? That means more area is gonna be in these outside points. And therefore, if we wanted to get an, a higher confidence level, we would need to have a wider graph. For example, we saw that 
usually within about two standard deviations. We have about 95% in the middle point here. However, if you look at T distributions with wider tails, you would expect in order to get that same 95%, you would have to have a wider range than the two standard deviations up and back. That's gonna be the general idea. Also remember that when we look at the T distributions, it's gonna be dependent upon uh, the degrees of freedom calculation, which we'll look at shortly, which are actually different T distributions depending on the, the size, the degrees of freedom. And then if you get the, the higher the number, the higher say our sample, for example, the more the T distribution is gonna get a skinnier and skinnier tail to at some point, it might be mirroring or get close to the skinniness of the tail that is characteristic of a normal uh, distribution. All right, so that's the general idea. So if we go back on over, we're gonna say we want confidence intervals, T distributions instead of normal distributions. What is the average output? So we can think about these as the peanut examples are basically our, our output uh, situation, which we're seeing how many outputs can we get? How many widgets can we make? For example, I know that's somewhat generic. I should get a little bit more creative, but that's the idea. And that should tend towards a bell shaped curve because if we have some kind of machine product item, you would expect it would have some central point and some standard error or standard deviation around it in a similar or bell-shaped curve. So this is gonna be our calculation. Now, when we think about the standard deviation, you will recall we have the standard deviation of the actual population, the standard deviation of the sample, which might tend towards the population, but not might not be exactly the population, especially with a small sample. And then you have the standard deviation of the concept as though we took every possible combination of a sample of whatever sample size, which we tended to use with this formula, which is the standard error calculation. So this second bit is the standard uh, error calculation. And this is measuring uh, uh, the, helping us with the range. Now it was the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of n. Now we don't have the standard deviation of the population we are imagining. Therefore, we have to approximate it with the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of n n being the sample size. So we'll get to that shortly. So the T distribution used if data is normal shape or n is large. So notice that if uh, the, the, if we have a normal shaped data, then oftentimes even with a small sample, we might still be able to use the T distributions, but we want a normal shaped data because the central limit theorem might not be kicking in for us to be able to get that nice bell-shaped curve even if the data itself is not uh, normally distributed. And then, or if n is large, so as n gets large, the T distribution graphs, as we looked at before, will tend towards uh, more of the normal distribution with the skinnier uh, tails and will be back similar to a normal situation. So here's gonna be our data, a, a graph of our data, and we have a, a bell-shaped curve. We'll get to that in a second. Let's go over here. We're gonna first make our data. This is the behind the scenes thing. If we we're watching a movie, this is what we know as the viewer of the movie, but the people in universe don't know it. So we have a better understanding of what's happening uh, from our perspective. We're gonna create our data. If we were in Excel, we would use the data analysis tool. If you wanna see how to do that in Excel, we, we do have another course or section in Excel, but I'll just point out some of those items to get an idea of how you might build this and you know play this with these numbers and work them on your own to get a better understanding. But this was generating, this generates our data around a mean of 2,500 standard deviation of the population about 304. These are randomly generated, but not in a uniform distribution using the data analysis, n having a normal distribution. So now I'm gonna look at the actual data that was output from this. We did 500 of these, therefore the count of the actual population, not the, not the sample, the population, we're gonna say it's 500. The mean, we put 2,500, that's exactly what it gave us. It might be rounded a little bit, but that's what actually was, was of the result. 
and notice the standard deviation of the population we input was 304. The standard deviation of these numbers is 309. Not exact, pretty close because they were randomly generated. If you want to know the Excel functions, this function for the count, we just summed, we counted all of these, that column. And if it was in Excel, the average is the means, adding them all up, dividing by the number of items there. Standard deviation would be the stdev.p of all of these items dot p because this is the population as opposed to the sample. All right, now we're gonna basically take the sample. This is what we know in universe. In universe, we wouldn't have all of the data. We would just be taking a sample of the data, hoping that we can apply the findings found from the sample to the characteristics of the population, which we as the viewer know. So we're gonna say then this sample how can I do that logistically in Excel? If I were in Excel, then I could just take like, I only have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 of these. That's a small sample. I could just take the first 10 numbers because these were randomly generated. Or I could in Excel put a random number next to it and shuffle it kind of like a deck of cards based on the random numbers that I generated or I could use an index function, which is what we did in this example, which means I'm gonna take an index of all of these numbers, and then I'm telling Excel, give me a random number between row one, the top of this uh, range, and row 500, which is the end of the range because we had a population that we're saying is 500, which is probably, you know, the real population in, our, in real life might be larger than that, but 500 gives us a good approximation for doing what we need to do with our sample here. All right, so based on that, then we have the X bar, which is gonna be the sample mean. Now, when we think about the mean, remember we could have the mean of the entire population. We could have the mean of the sample. That's what we're taking here. And you could imagine the mean of every combination of sample of sample size 10, in this case, out of a population of 500, which is a number we wouldn't really have, but you can imagine that that's kind of what we were approximating when we look at the standard deviation. So this is the mean calculated, uh, well, it's just the average of these numbers, uh, 2,486, uh, which is fairly close to the mean of the population here, 2,500, even though we only took a sample of 10 out of 500. Then we have the standard deviation uh, of the sample. So notice the formula we used here is a little different than this formula because this was standard deviation of the population. This is standard deviation of the sample, which is just taking these 10 numbers and giving us the standard deviation. So the, the actual, it's quite different than the population, which was 309 versus uh, the 203. It could be quite different in part because of, of course, the fact that we only have 10 numbers out of the 5,000, which we might be able to uh, accommodate or, or deal with by, instead of using normal distributions, using the T distributions, which have the fatter tails, resulting in a larger range. Now, the number of samples is just one. We just took one sample of 10. And that is gonna allow us to calculate this crucial factor when using T distributions, which is called the DF, we're gonna call it equals the degrees of freedom. So the degrees of freedom is just gonna be the count 10 minus the number of samples. In our case, we only took one sample, therefore degrees of freedom is nine. That number is important because the actual chart of T distributions that we will be generating, Excel will generate, is actually different depending on the degrees of freedom. And as the degrees of freedom goes up, the chart gets skinnier in the tails, getting closer and closer to a normal distribution and if you get past like even like 50 and certainly up to like 100 or for example of a sample count then it starts it starts to get the, the tails get a lot thinner than the smaller sample count so notice we have a pretty small sample here of only the 10. all right so then we have the standard error calculation so this was the count i just counted them counted these numbers we saw there was 10. the standard error calculation is going to be then our formula over here. Standard error was normally, I'm just looking at this bit right here. It was normally the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of N, which is the sample size, if we knew 
the standard deviation of the population, which we don't. Therefore, we can approximate this with the S, which is standing for the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of the sample size. Here's the formula, uh, square root of, you know, the, the, the standard deviation of the sample, which is going to be uh, this number, 203, divided by the sample square root of the sample size, which is 10. Okay, so that's going to that's going to in essence be the standard deviation that we will use when we create the bell curve. So you will recall we've got the standard deviation of the population, which we don't know. We've got the standard deviation of the sample, which might approximate towards the standard deviation of the population. But what we want is like the standard deviation of all possible combinations in essence of 10, which we can approximate with the formula. That's the standard deviation, which we're going to call the standard error in essence, which will tend towards that bell shaped curve or will most likely tend toward that bell shaped curve. All right. Confidence level 95% generic number, meaning that we're going to make an interval which will pick up the the within it the actual mean around 95% of the time, which means that we're accepting 5% of the time, the result could land by chance alone outside of our confidence level. I pick 95% a lot because that's like the default percent, but if you wanna be more confident, you can increase the confidence level uh, and so on. And then alpha is gonna be the range outside the confidence level. So if I go back on over here, 95% in the middle, 5% in the tails, and then each tail, because it's symmetrical, will be five divided by two, the 2.5. So we've got each tail at A divided by two or the 2.5%. So then we can calculate our T. Now we're looking like at the upper T. Now this is kind of equivalent uh, to the Z calculation and it's gonna be using our T functions in Excel now, which is gonna be equal to uh, T dot inverse. We have to say one minus, cause it's gonna be a hundred, you know, hundred, minus and then we're picking up that 2.5 uh the the 2.5 and then the degrees of freedom is the sample size minus the sample count which is picking up then the nine so that's going to give us uh the upper point in t's so if i look at my graph 95 in the middle five percent on the tails we can measure like this point in T's, which are similar to Z's, in essence, standard deviations, middle point at zero T's up to the T's up here. And then we can also measure it in terms of X's. So now we're looking at it in terms of T's to get to this point, uh, to get to that upper point. Okay. So, so that's, that's the upper point. And so then we're going to say then the uh, margin of error calculation is going to be then and we can do this a couple different ways we have the this calculation confidence dot t but we can more straightforwardly say okay well the the middle uh well, no we just take the standard error which is our standard deviation in in essence x's is 64.26 that's per t per standard error right per standard deviation in essence, and then times the 2.26. So that's gonna give us the 104, uh, around, it's rounded 22 about or 37 about. Okay, also just wanna point out before I get, before I forget, notice that to get 95%, you would think that if this was a Z, it would be about two on each side, something a little under two, but now it's at 2.26, why? Because our, our bell curve is uh, wider, right? So, so it takes a, a, a larger degrees uh, or range. Now, the other way we can calculate this is with the confidence dot T. Uh, so now we have confidence dot T for the T distributions. We want the alpha, so we have the 2.5. We want the standard deviation. Now, this one's a little bit tricky because you would think that that would be the standard error but it actually wants the standard deviation. In this case, we don't have of the population, therefore standard deviation of the sample, which in this case would be the 203 uh, would be that one. And then it wants the size and the size. And again, you would think it might want the degrees of freedom, but it's gonna basically do that itself. So it wants the count of the 10. 
and we should get basically to uh, the same result, two ways to calculate the degrees of freedom. I think the first one is more kind of intuitive uh, to me, you know, but the other one might be a little faster in some cases. So then we can get to our range in terms of X's. So if we think of our range in terms of X's, we're building the graph around the middle point, which is gonna have the average of two, four, eight, nine. And then I'm gonna say minus the, the margin of error, 145.37. That's gonna give us our two, three, four, four about. And then if we take the middle point, which is gonna be the two, four, eight, nine, plus the margin of error, 145.37, we get about the upper bit. 2634. So if I go back on over here to our graph, then, so now we're saying it was 95% in the middle. These two points can be measured. It was in Z's, which are now T's because it's a T distribution, which has fatter tails at something greater than two because, it, because of the fatter tails. And then now we've measured it in X's here, which was like 2634 or so in X's uh, on the X to measure this range. Okay, so then let's go back on over and we can say, all right, uh, so, so now I can also generate this data like automatically in Excel by going to data analysis, which you'd have to turn on in Excel, but then you can look at the descriptive statistics and then we're gonna select, you know, the output range and we're we're picking our i'm sorry the input range which are these numbers if i pick up the sample i'm going to tell it that there's a label the first one is a label i'm going to output it you know in our sheet that's what this is saying and then i'm clicking these both off noting that i can change this 95 percent if i wanted to i believe it's at 95 percent by default and it gives us our summary of result the mean the standard deviation now these are different than what I have over here because every time I click on something in Excel because I used random formulas, it reshuffles. So these numbers are, are different, but they're not different if you look at the worksheet. It's just because I'm reshuffling the sheet and every time you click this thing, it reshuffles. So, so that's the mean, standard, error, median, mode, standard deviation, the sample variance and so on and so forth. And uh, so that's a great little tool, however, it, it's not dynamic. So this output will not change as like I shuffle the numbers around if I'm, if I'm using that kind of situation. So that's a great summary tool just to point that out. Now I'm gonna graph this. This time uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be looking at it uh, a little bit backwards than what we've seen in the past in order to make the graph. So in the past, I looked at the range and I first thought about my X's in terms of four standard deviations away. But it's a little bit easier when using these T distributions to first think about the T's. And you will recall that, that the T's are kind of like the Z's. And you will recall that if, these, if this was a normal bell-shaped curve, that around 95% is in the middle, and, and, and that would be two standard deviations away. If you go three standard deviations away in a normal bell-shaped curve, that's a lot of the data. And if you go four standard deviations away, you have almost all of the data in it, even though in theory it goes on forever, right? So, you can't, so it's never gonna pick up everything because it goes on forever. So, but with a T distribution, it has fatter tails, but still you would expect that four T's, four standard deviations away from the middle would pick up most of the data. So I'll just put negative four to 3.99, and that's gonna keep on going. And it's a pretty long and detailed uh, format to do it this way because, because it's just going a 0.01 steps. And then, and then I calculate the, the, uh, the percent based on the T which is gonna be the T dot dist. And I'm gonna be picking up this number for the X, the degrees of freedom are going to be uh, nine. And then uh, does it, is it gonna be cumulative? I'm gonna say no. And then that gives me my P of X information. And then I can also calculate my X because if this is my T, that's how far away the X should be in T's, which I can now convert to uh, X's, right? So I can say, well, if the middle point is, if, if the middle point is, uh, is uh, two, 
four eight nine two four eight nine let's actually start this way so i can i don't get messed up in my calculator if i say the standard error is six four point two six times four so that's going to be four of in essence the standard deviations or t's away and then i'm going to say that minus because it's a negative the middle point of the two four eight nine is going to give us then and it's it should be positive i just went but it's to the two two three two about so i can then use that formula to convert all all of these making sure i use absolute references to properly calculate it so i can get my x's and then i can take this formula which is basically saying give me the range in terms of t's i, I calculated it in terms of t's in this case which would be saying i want it to be within negative uh two t's to positive two t's i could have done it in terms of x's saying it needs to be the x needs to be between two four two three four four and two six three four right so that's going to be this one and then the formula i put in here is if and then and because there's two conditions and i want this t has to be uh has to be greater than negative 2.26 and it has to be less than positive 2.26 and you can see that's going to be like in the middle it's way down here so that so it calculates the middle so this middle bit then graphing that out the middle bit is is where the 95 percent under the curve should be i'm not too worried about the percentages being a little bit wonky here because i'm really kind of thinking of the curve as 100 percent under the curve right now is the general idea and then 95 percent here the endpoints of my curve are going to be at the 2.26. So in standard deviations around here, 2.26 or so looks about right, I think, right? 2.26. And then I could also measure it in terms of the X's, which should be the range of 2344 to 2634. So 23 two three four four would be around here to two six four four or something something up here around here so the general idea is i can measure this curve 100 percent under the curve 95 percent in the middle five percent in the tails but in order to encompass the 95 percent range on a wider tailed t distribution we need to have more than two standard deviations out. It was like two point something, 2.26 to get that 95% in the middle, which we can then also convert to X's. That's why we have the two axes that we can determine uh, down here. And then of course, if I look at that middle point, what did I get? I got the two, four, eight, nine. Does that lie? Is that, what was it actually? The mean was two, five, zero, zero. So it's quite close. And the range was two, three, four, four uh up to two six so clearly our actual number two five is between these two now if i ran this over and over again if i did it a hundred times you would expect by random chance alone that five percent of the time it might not show up in here so five out five out of a hundred it might not show up in this range due to random error if you want to reduce that risk then of course we can lower we can increase the confidence level lowering alpha resulting in a larger range giving us more confidence but less specificity